Howdy, my name is Frances Jackson. My pronouns are they, them. I'm the coordinator of the LGBTQ plus Bride Center in the Office of the Dean of Student Life here at Texas A&M University. I'd like to start off by thanking our Pride Live uh, with our panelist, Dr. Matt Hoffman, DPN, AP, RN, FNP slash C, um, <laughs> clinical assistant professor in the College of Nursing, um, and uh, Katrina Don Stewart, the executive director of the Pride Community Center, uh, for coming to speak with us on the many aspects of gender transitioning tonight. We're going to start off the panel um, with some introductions. We'll have them tell us a little bit about yourself. Then I have some questions prepped for folks, um, and then we will turn it over to some audience questions. Folks can submit questions either on the Facebook live stream or can message the center directly on Facebook. Um, and then we will um, close out with some final thoughts. All right. And with that, um, Katie, would you like to go first? Sure. So as you said, I'm the executive director of Pride Community Center here in uh, the Brazos Valley in Bryan College Station. And um, I've been doing LGBT advocacy uh, with a uh, very specific transgender focus uh, since about 2003, 2004. Um, as well as educating whoever will listen <laughs> about the same topic. Um, I, I was from around 2011 to 2015, I was in a group called TENT, Transgender Education Network of Texas, and I was the head of the board, and then I became the uh, executive director uh, and served in that for a few years. Um, prior to that, I had been a regular board member from like 2009 to 2011. And, you know, serving a state as big as Texas with all the differences and all of the rural greatness that we have is a challenge. Uh, and it was then, uh, but I was happy to do it and I learned a lot. Um, and uh, I've been in the Bryan College Station this whole time and uh, have uh, done a lot of advocacy here. Uh, my starts were probably in PFLAG, Parents, Families, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Uh, and like you said, now I'm with Pride Community Center. Uh, I'll jump in. Uh, howdy, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Matt Hoffman. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns, and I have been with the College of Nursing and a and uh, since 2012. Um, I have a private practice as a family nurse practitioner, and um, I do primary care, but I also specialized in integrative health and home services. So um, that is a big chunk of what I do in terms of clinical practice. Um, in the College of Nursing, I teach um, I used to teach undergrad, but now I teach primarily in our graduate program, advanced pathophysiology and advanced pharmacology, as well as clinical um, faculty for our FNP students and their primary care families. So um, I tend to many hats and keep myself very busy um, and have certainly um, lived in College Station, as um, Katie mentioned, for uh, over a decade now. I consider College Station my new home base and um, have just really enjoyed being a resource um, as much as I can and enjoying recruiting great people like you, Frankie. So um, yeah, just happy to be here and talk with y'all tonight. I'm so excited to have this in-depth conversation with both of you. So I think the thing I wanted to start off with, because it's something that I feel like is sometimes more achievable for folks than other aspects of transitioning, um, is social transitioning. So I wanted to get folks' take on what um, do you consider to be social transitioning, and then what are some ways someone can socially transition? So social social transitioning, I, I, I think the simplest way to put it is is living in the gender that you know you are, uh, presenting yourself, and and I would extend that you know on a part time or full time basis. Whether you're doing it you know a few hours a day to twenty hours a week to all the time, it's all important. Um, and what you quick what you quickly understand 
is how people are treated differently based on their gender usually when you go through such a journey. <laughs> um, but it, you know, just in living your, your life as the gender you identify as for whatever amount of time, um, there are some unique challenges there, you know, and, and we're going to cover some of them tonight from legal to, you know, being able to, for, to be accepted as you present yourself, um, uh, m medical sort of issues that would come, that could come up or that you may want to pursue as part of, of your overall health plan, uh, all kinds of things. Um, but just the unique ways in which we interact as people based on the gender that we see presented in front of us are fascinating and often disheartening to people too. And so, um, you know, I, I would say for anyone undergoing this sort of journey, get a support team of some kind around you. Absolutely. Um, I'll add to that, but before I say anything, um, I feel it's always important for me to clarify that as a cis male, yet a member of the LGBT community, um, everything that I provide in terms of insight is always from um, my clinical experiences. So certainly I've got more ex um, experience with the prescribing side of things, but I can certainly share um, what I've seen and learned from my patients because there's certainly a lot of ongoing learning. Um, Matt, but, oh hold, yeah. You, you tossed out a real great word there for folks. And so I just wanna make sure we get that covered. What does CIS mean and what does it stand for? Oh, um, sure. Uh, cis or cisgender is um, specifically regarding an individual that is living in their gender assigned at birth. Um, that's one way of putting it. Other individuals may have different um, verbs or, or ways of describing or other, but um, certainly that's my personal interpretation. And anytime we talk about words and phrases, everyone has their own spin and, and personal definition that applies to them. Um, so. Um, the thing I was just going to add to the social component, um, I loved what Katie said about whether it's part-time, full-time, and the only thing I would add is whether it be virtual or real life um, as well, because I have a lot of patients that are out to friends um, and connections in a virtual aspect, maybe people that they've never met. And um, again, it's it's essentially, a, a you know, it's like a form of outing oneself. And um, regardless of how you do it, you may not just out yourself to the world in the immediacy of the moment, but maybe to the small trusted individuals, dip your toes in the water and then dive on in when you're comfortable. So um, there can always be with every aspect of what we're gonna talk about, everyone having different comfort levels. And some people might really just, um, in my clinical practice, I've been really um, intrigued to see, fascinated by how there's just always a different level of some individuals are absolutely fine with, um, you know, being socially out to the close individuals in their circle, their chosen family, um, and that's all they need. Um, you know, that's really all that they care about and that's all that matters. But certainly on the other hand, there are individuals that certainly want everyone to um, be on the same page. So. I guess the, the second part of that question was, what are um, some ways someone can socially transition? What are some, you know, some tips and tricks or things like that for folks that we might have? I know when I talk to students, I often talk about um, something Katie recommended to me once was that the whole Starbucks trick when trying to find um, a name that really identifies for you is that a a barista will call whatever you want. Um, and so that was a very, you know, euphoric experience that um, Katie once recommended to me. So I think just th those are the things I'm just sort of looking for if someone's watching this, just ways that they might be able to engage with that. Thank you. That's a great jumping off point. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Because as, as you know, um, many times we test those things out with friends too. And so you could go through 10, 15, 100 different, different choices and, and test them all out and have your friends say, no, you should be God Thor of the universe instead of Bob. You know, uh, so <laughs> it's, it's a good way to, to, to get some feedback on that. Um, 
you know, again, you can do it part time, full time. You, you might want to start off in some safe spaces um, in group of in, in events that are LGBTQ plus friendly. Um, you could always come to a support group that Pride Community Center offers. We offer a gender affirming support group uh, second Monday of every month at Friends Church. You're welcome to come there. Uh, we have people more than willing to talk, 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 talk. Um, I'm, I'm thinking back to when I did it. And, and honestly, for me, I had started cross-dressing at home and then I knew, no, this, this, there's more to it than this, right? And I'm probably gonna horrify Matt. The first thing I did uh, when a psychologist told me, no, you can't have hormones was I ordered black market hormones. I would not recommend that at all. Um, I also tried herbal things like estrogen. Again, I would not recommend that at all. <laughs> Uh, I would recommend getting with a, a good health practitioner uh, on that journey. Um, but we, you know, we do all kinds of crazy things as we're starting out. Um, for me, though, before I actually got my legal name change, I was going sometimes to appointments and stuff as myself and sometimes not. So I had a therapist for a while in Austin, Texas. Well, I had to drive two hours but back and forth and you know, might get stopped by the cops one way or another. So I tended to portray in what I thought was a very unisex sort of style. Um, my therapist did not think so. They did not think I was pursuing femininity enough, but you do what you can with what risks exist for you. Um, it wasn't until um, when I started getting my hormones correct and getting on board with a good health team, I had sought out UTMB in um, Galveston. And Dr. Avery, the first thing he said was, get off all that other stuff you're on. I need a baseline. Let's get a baseline of, of, of everything. Uh, and you know, then let's set up you coming out to see me. And when I went out to see him, I thought, well, it hasn't worked with that therapist in Austin. I'm just gonna be myself. And I was very nervous. I think, well, at least for me, I was very nervous about how I looked, whether I was passable, whether I was convincing, whether my voice was right, my walk was right, all the myriad little things to pass as a woman. Now, not everybody, that was me. And that's, you know, that's not one size fits all. Um, people are going to have different experiences. People are going to want different things. Some things may not matter to them. And that's great. That's fine. But for me, seeing Dr. A Dr. Avery and he knew I was nervous. And the first thing he says was, I don't see why you're worried. You passed just fine. You're beautiful. And that sealed it for me. I was then ready once I got my legal documentation to present at work. Um, now, coming up to that, you know, I had HR meetings. I had meetings with supervisors and stuff like that. I would present that way and um, so that they would, we got to know each other in a different sort of perspective. So I kind of rambled on a bit about stuff there, but the point is there's a lot of different journeys and how far you want to go is up to you. Yeah, you pulled on a lot of things there like style, um, you know, obviously dressing can be a big part of it. You talk about names. Um, I don't know if you brought up pronouns or not, um, but having an affirming therapist, um, transitioning at work, obviously something that can be very big when we think about the job search, you know, having preferred names or pronouns, um, something that's gone back and forth. So yeah, I think you, you touched on a lot of things in a, in a story narrative. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry, Matt, you were going to add to that. I was just gonna say, I love doing all of these or having all these opportunities to um, get to talk to y'all and Katie um, and hear more of Katie's story. Uh, I promise I'm, I wasn't horrified. Um, I would actually add that any um, LGBT, especially um, trans and gender affirming healthcare provider has heard it all. So um, it's not a surprise. And certainly I always share with my patients everything that I do is to ensure your safety and help you along your journey. It's an honor for me to be able to do what I do and help be that starting point for individuals. And I wouldn't even say it's a starting point because it certainly starts far 
uh, ahead of individuals meeting me, but kind of having that reality um, is um, of being able to provide that service is great. Um, and, you know, everything that Katie added in terms of the different nuanced ways and, oh, you know, the circles that you can um, do that in and come out to, you know, it's social. Um, we're literally talking about social aspects. So the different environments with which we socialize and individuals that we socialize, um, you know, there are so many ways to slice the pie. Is that what the phrase is? I can't remember. I don't like to use the cat one because that's just, I'm a big animal lover. But, um, you know, you can slice the pie so many different ways. Um, you can, it gets to be customized. And that's definitely one of the things that all aspects of transition get to be customized and catered to individuals. And I think I will add one more social thing. Um, I've loved hearing from patients that, um, you know, social media, good or bad, um, it certainly is creating awareness and presence. And um, I enjoy seeing and hearing people's stories. Um, but one of the things that sometimes is a downside of um, the social aspect is individuals may get, it might get imprinted on someone that, oh, well, I need to do it this way because I saw so-and-so did it. Um, or I, when I'm dealing with patients a lot, um, well, so-and-so told me that their levels are blah. And so every person is completely different. We're talking apples, oranges, kumquats, pineapples, everything. Um, so uh, it doesn't have to be a certain way because you saw it that way. It gets to be your way. Because maybe you were born that way. Okay, I'm done. Awesome. All right. Yeah, I think Matt brings up a really great point about um, sort of that virtual space. Obviously, there are things like Discord or Facebook groups, Instagram, um, a lot of really great options for folks to express themselves. But yeah, it's very important that we keep our eye on our own paper and don't um, focus not only for transitioning, but for mental health in general, right? So um, excellent points from both of you. All right. So our next aspect is legal transitioning. Um, so again, I'm going to ask for y'all, um, just we have a solid definition for this conversation. What is a legal transition? Um, and then what are barriers to legal transitions? So at, it, at its simplest form, legal transition would be changing your legal documents to the gender and name that you now want to go by, conceivably for the rest of your life. But you know, marriages happen, things happen. But for your foreseeable future, maybe we say that. Um, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to talk about. Um, I remember in my time with Transgender Education Network of Texas, we had a parent who we had multiple parents who had children who were transgender, and the the, the students could not, the kids could not get affirming care or affirming conditions if they were in some sort of facility um, for the gender they identified with because their legal documents did not say the correct marker. Uh, so, you know, someone who was born male who had been on, perhaps they'd been on female hormones for a while and had, you know, developed breasts and were, you know, very much looked like a woman being put in a male facility, whether that was in uh, something like a, a work program, um, God forbid, you know, detention of some kind, prison yeah. of some kind, school, all kinds of places that are sex segregated. And some of those may be taking up more of their lives and some being just temporarily in the damage that can occur there. Some of it possibly very serious. If we're talking prison, if we're talking work camps, if we're talking living situations in which someone could get sexually assaulted by how they, how they look and that they're not in the right place. For me as executive director at the time, that was the hardest, most frustrating thing because you try to make those changes for the people you're serving uh, or get some leniency from those establishments. And too many times you can't. And so too many times we would have to go back to parents and say, okay, the best thing you can do is do a legal transition, uh, get, the, get the documents in order. The problem with legal transition, so there's multiple ones. One is the cost. 
Uh, now, to help with costs, there are free health, free legal clinics that pop up around the state. Uh, I believe there's one in Houston quite often that one of the law schools uh, puts on out there. There's one in Austin, I believe, pretty regularly that uh, the law school at UT puts on. Uh, and there, I know there are others, I just don't. Those are the two that come to the top of my mind. Uh, so that's an option. Um, you can get uh, a lawyer, hire a lawyer. Again, there's money there and there, there could be a lot of money. It just depends on the lawyer and what they charge for that sort of thing. Texas is constantly changing, so I cannot give you an exact for right now. I will tell you when I transitioned, it was... Um, you could get a court order and you could get your name, your name and gender changed. Um, it was piecemeal throughout the state. So you could go to a judge in San Antonio, which I ended up finally, I originally did it on my own. And then later I got the famous Phyllis Fry to help me get, I get, basically got a name change by myself, went back and got the gender change because I was afraid doing it in Brazos Valley at the time, I couldn't get a gender change. Phyllis Fry, fix that for me later in my life. Um, judge in San Antonio though, for instance, Phyllis knew this person, knew how they were. Um, we went in front of them. I think there were like five to 10 of us at a time early in the morning. The judge signed off on them all right there. Other judges in Texas, you might have to have a letter from a therapist, a letter from um, someone like Matt, uh, a letter, a permission slip basically from whoever they decide. Um, and that, that and the cost tend to be prohibitive uh, for a number of people. Um, so it runs, it, it, it runs the gambit. Um, similarly, once you get that document, then going through the process of changing your other documents, for instance, your driver's license, your social security card, et cetera, et cetera. Some of those are pretty easy. Uh, Social Security was for me. Driver's license was for me, but driver's license started shutting down in terms of how lenient they would be on sex designation on driver's license cards shortly after I, tra I started transition. Um, I don't know how it is now, but for a while there, it was very strict that even if you had documentation, they didn't care. Uh, for me, it was like, oh yeah, you should be female. We'll put F on your driver's license. Um, and then there's, you know, there's there's the things like your name at school. Don't know what A&M's policy is now. Um, what I found out going through the A&M system, my undergraduate degree was with my name, male name. I transitioned. I changed it with the university. Had my diploma reissued with my female name. Uh, and then I went and took graduate classes. And the first letter I said, I received said, uh, you know, hello, Mr. Stewart. And I'm like, uh, excuse me, <laughs> what you say? And apparently on the back end of Texas A&M system, I was still designated male, even though everything else had been changed. So suffice it to say there are there are big points you have to hit legally, but then there's also minutia within that. Um, credit card changes, all of that. There's many little things uh, that you can go into. I, um, as you were Yeah, thinking through, about the sheer number of places where someone's legal name is, is overwhelming. Did I lose all? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Matt. Okay, okay, cool. Um, as Katie was talking, I made a nice list over in the margins of, of things to talk about and kind of add to because it is just insane. Um, the minutia, that was the best description because um, there are big steps and then there are little steps um, and there are barriers, some individuals being barriers along the way. Um, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but um, it's one of those aspects that I see where some of my patients cannot wait to get it done. It is like they want that immediately as soon as they take their first pill or take their first shot. And um, 
Then I have some that it does not matter to them. That is just a piece of paper and um, they're okay both ways. Um, so um, the barriers there, like I said, I created a nice list over here. Um, the costs, especially in terms of getting the, um, the court order, um, Katie had mentioned that, but there are little minutia built in, in terms of the fingerprint fees and just all of these other aspects that go into um, the other parts of getting the court order, um, especially if you are traveling, um, the travel costs. Um, if you're taking time off from work to go and get this done, you're missing pay. Um, so there are definitely these other things that do add up. Um, and unfortunately, I have gotten to the point where when I counsel patients um, on this, I encourage them to go out of town. Um, I've seen too many negative experiences with the Brazos court system locally um, that I don't trust them. And um, I don't trust them to be kind or civil to my patients. And um, that's one of the, the aspects that it's unfortunate and it may mean added cost, but there is a, um, I, would, I would rather, if it were me, I would rather pay for that kind of almost assurance of a more positive outcome compared to what we know historically has and can happen um, with this process in Brazos County. Um, and Katie mentioned to it as well, mentioned it as well, but Texas has there's been some variability over time and um, COVID also created a new temporary window of variability when everything was shut down. Um, but the process actually will also vary by state, um, especially with determining which documents can be changed, et cetera. Um, and so if you're gonna be moving to a different state and gonna look, um, I encourage you to start from scratch and kind of do your homework in that other state um, because it really will be a little bit different. There are also some interesting procedural things um, from a federal standpoint. So for example, um, if you want to get your passport changed, since that's a federal document, the process is um, different uh, in terms of what they need. So for example, I'm a nurse practitioner. I cannot write a letter on behalf of a patient to get their name changed. It has to be done by a physician with an MDDO. And so it must be physician and then um, yeah, it's just a very weird, arbitrary thing. So I can get somebody hormones, but I can't make this one little piece of paper change. So I found a workaround. It's still legal, by the way, um, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, so um, it's one of those, like I said, just little minutia that just kind of make you scratch your head and say, what? Just this is ridiculous. So um, the other thing Katie had mentioned as well is there's the option of doing the name alone and leaving a gender marker by itself um, or doing both of them together. Um, certainly it um, the benefit in my mind from a, uh, when considering the minutia is um, the ability to kind of just sever it and then just start anew um, with all of the information. Um, it helps, and the reason why I say that is I think of the things I deal with in my world like insurance. So um, if a name and a gender marker are designated on a policy, then the policy has to be changed to reflect that. So there might be windows in time where there's this incongruence among the documents and somebody might be without coverage. Um, so that's just kind of, it's an easier thing to say, let's just do this all in one swoop. But um, I still recognize that there might be reasons individuals might choose one um, and not do both. Um, the other thing um, in Texas, in my experience as of late with patients, um, the process is getting that court order then the social security number comes next because DPS will then allow that um, change of document with the evidence of the social security number and the court order. Um, but it's been, again, it's a constant moving target 
I might be saying a totally different thing next month. Um, we know Texas is notorious for its ridiculous legislative changes and policy changes. So stay tuned. Why do we live here? Anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think that we brought up passports and other stuff. Um, there is the process, I think, the um, Biden administration announced that you could have an X marker on your passport. I haven't seen anything move forward with that, but I'm curious. And I know California is allowing that. And um, New York has gone back and forth on that. So we'll we'll see where X's go in the future. Um, Katie brought up talking about a and um, and their policies. Unfortunately, universities are known for having many, many systems that may have legal or other names in them and stuff. And so at the moment, like many other schools, um, you know, you have to go piecemeal system by system and stuff like that. So the Pride Center does have some guides on how to do that, but yeah, it is more complicated. However, with legal changes with states like New York and California, if, um, systems um, that are being used at the universities are being forced to update. So we may see um, some national trends encourage some things locally fairly soon. Um, with that, um, I want to move on to medical transitioning. Uh, medical transitioning, um, I think, is something that gets focused on quite a bit for the trans community. Um, it's something um, that is, I think, uh, now referred to as gender affirming surgery. Um, it's been known as the surgery, sex reassignment, bottom surgery um, is, it's just what we get like the most attention. Um, and so I wanted to talk about the many aspects of medical transitioning, understanding that um, gender affirming surgery is what gets focused on quite a bit. So with that, um, I'll open the floor. Matt, why don't you start us off on this one? Okay. Um... I absolutely will be happy to. So um, especially when we're talking medical, um, again, I'm taking medical in terms of the non-hormonal aspects. Um, so that way we're, we're clear there. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, the surgeries, there are so many different surgeries. Um, and the interesting thing is that in Texas, you know, thank God there are providers that provide surgeries, um, you know, not necessarily immediately in Bryan College Station. Hopefully something will change to that end at some point in the future. But um, the thing that I like to share with patients um, from a medical standpoint, we look and really rely on evidence-based practice as well as standards of practice and guidelines. So the WPATH um, standards of care or standards of practice and the University of California at San Francisco's um, guidelines really are what guide a lot of my practice as well as time and me in practice. Um, but from a surgical standpoint, there are specific criteria that are outlined in WPATH to um, what their recommendations are for these surgical interventions. Um, and they vary depending on age. So for example, minors versus individuals that are 18 plus. And so oftentimes those do encompass a certain time period, um, you know, where the transitioning has happened, the, the legal transition optional, it's kind of lumped in with the social transition. Um, but then the amount of time spent on hormone therapy is usually something that is um, addressed as well. Um, and so it's one of those aspects that um, I hate to be somebody that, um, would ever deny somebody a treatment or an intervention, but I'm always very clear to share with patients, you know, this guideline recommends this time frame. You've not yet reached that. You're obviously able to go and have surgical consults. I'm still happy to write a letter, but oftentimes in my letter, I would indicate that, you know, um, they have achieved nine out of the recommended 12 months per X guideline. And it's not to kind of point to flaws or say anything along those lines, but I'm signing a medical document, my name on it, my license and my reputation. And it's important for me to let other providers know that I recognize that this has not been met, but all of these other aspects are. And if the surgeon ultimately is happy, you know, the, the surgeons can absolutely um, take care of a um, operation or whatever intervention is needed. Um, 
even without having met those guidelines. But it's just one of those things that in my practice, I make sure to share and educate. And um, oftentimes, especially the very first visit in my um, practice, I give patients a copy of some pages out of WPATH and um, the UCSF guidelines because those documents are available to everyone. And I love when patients are informed and, and kind of know that information in advance because sometimes I, it, the, I do kind of feel like the, the bad guy in some cases when I'm like, okay, we got to pump the brakes just a little bit. Um, I would rather a patient already be mindful of that instead of me having to say, okay, we can't do that just yet just because of this arbitrary timeline so I'll, I'll stop there well i think some of the social aspects can help right like if we can't have top surgery right away are there ways to dress mind or you know or push a bras or other stuff like that so that we can feel affirmed in our bodies even if like medically things are not being met right now so i think one of the reasons we really wanted to hit on the many aspects of transitioning yeah. is that like we need the access because you know you're like let's say you're in front of someone like you right like you you've got the time money and access at that point right like those civil right like very very big barriers the time and money mm -hmm. katie what are some of the aspects you wanted to touch on with medical transitioning um there's there's a lot to it right we you mentioned you mentioned the surgery and even to this day, people ask me, have you had the surgery? And I'm like, which one are you talking about? <laughs> um, or, or the other favorite of mine is, have you completed transitioning? And I'm like, I'm not dead yet. I believe we changed throughout our whole lives. Um, so yeah, there's, there's different surgeries. Um, and there's other stuff too. So let me start with some of the other stuff. There's electrolysis for if you know you have facial hair that you want to get rid of uh, to appear more feminine. If that's the you know proper way to say it, I don't I don't want to place a gender on facial hair, but there you go. Um, that can be costly. I can tell you, I had very light, almost non-existent facial hair, chest hair, stuff like that. And I still had to get a minimum of 40 hours of electrolysis where they stick a needle in you, zap you, and it, it adds up. It adds up really fast. Uh, we've talked about uh, hormones. Um, for me, for surgery, honestly, I got to a point where my insurance was beginning to deny my male hormone blocker, which at the time was spironolactone. Um, and the reason they denied it was they said it was counterindicated for women unless they are, they basically have a hairy condition. They're very hairy, right? And it was a big deal. I had to get my HR team involved. They had to get legal involved to get the insurance company. You know, it may be easier now, but back then it was all these people had to get involved just to tell the insurance company, just fill the damn prescription. After that happened, I had enough. <laughs> so I started seeking an orchiectomy, which is just simply removal of the testicles, which would remove uh, the main source of um, testosterone in the body for me so that I wouldn't have to take the hormone blockers, that the, the female hormones would work more effectively for me in the route I was going. Let me emphasize that again, because there's different ways of doing things. Um, Years later, I got a grant and was able to get um, genital reconstruction, gender, gender confirming surgery, you know, the many different names it goes about to basically, out of what was left, create a, um, a vagina and um, the inner parts of the vagina, and, you know, stuff like that. Um, a lot of times, I think one of the points I want to make is one, people often ask, oh, you went through that. Are you happier now? No. <laughs> and here's what I mean by that. I don't mean that it wasn't worthwhile to me and it didn't have an impact and I don't feel more comfortable in my body for me. What I mean is the surgery is not the end all to everything in your life. 
you will still experience depression. You will still experience ups and downs. You still have to pay bills. <laughs> you still have to do life. Um, it simply, for me, it fit. That I, it, there's no better way for me to really explain it other than it just fit me. Um, so um, that being here, the, the, the thing, the other thing that immediately hit me after surgery, surgeons are great at one particular thing, creating beautiful works of art out of your body parts, <laughs> right? Doing amazing cutting and sewing and stuff like that. They are not always the best at aftercare. They are not always the best at what do you do next as you recover from that surgery. Now, a lot of them have instructions. That's about as far as it goes, is instructions. It's not, well, this is happening, what do I do? That's where nurses come in. That's where other people in your community come in. So for me, I had all kinds of questions. I mean, honestly, after I went back to work, I'm like, why does it feel like I'm sitting on my vagina the whole time? Because that's what it felt like to me. I had this swollen vagina, it felt like I was sitting on it the whole time. How do I take care of it? Luckily, there were some very knowledgeable women in uh, the communities I associate with that would give very good suggestions. Um, and that's what you really need. There have been studies that have shown that, um, that uh, there's a risk of depression after surgeries because of the surgery itself. That may be the case. I always think you need to really look carefully at those studies and really be critical of all the aspects of them. My, base, my biggest criticism of them is what was the aftercare? What was the team in place after the person went through that and how were they supported? How were they supported with the after effects of the surgery? How were they supported socially after that? What were, you know, how was their family life? There are so many factors there that you can't, okay, let, let's consider COVID, right? Someone has surgery at the beginning of COVID and then we're in lockdown for all this time. And what if you don't have any care? The, the possibility of depression and suicidality must go up. So we really have to have that aftercare. The other thing I would say about um, medical stuff is just because you've had the surgery does not mean you no longer have to worry about parts that you might still have. So for instance, I still have a prostate. I still need to be tested for prostate cancer. Um, and doctors need to know about that. They need to take that into consideration. Um, and the same is the opposite way for trans men or for those that um, are having surgeries to be more male. There may be aspects of their biology that still have to be taken into account uh, and to make sure that that, that is done. Um, I had a doctor who we had a very interesting conversation one day. She had sent off my prostate enzyme test to a local lab and they said, no, this is not correct. This person is a woman. And she said, I'm the doctor. I ordered it. You need to do it. And they were, no, no, no. And she said, yes, you will. <laughs> I'm the doctor and I ordered it. <laughs> so um, there's... There's challenging things like that that come up when you have a community of both medical providers like Matt, as well as friends that can support you uh, and other things. It's, it's an easy, it's, I'm not gonna say easier because there's not anything easy about it. You are better preserved as a whole person if you have a team with you. I, I want to jump on a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> one of the aspects, especially kind of going back to the social transitioning and the legal piece, um, you know, I, I mentioned the issue with insurance. So as you were sharing that, I was like, insurance would certainly kick back a lab fee um, for that type of scenario where they're going to create that same argument. Wait, why is this? we're not going to pay for a woman to have their prostate checked, um, that type of thing. So there are just these 
these minutiae that certainly can be triggering. And I've seen them, um, seen patients get triggered by these aspects. Um, and so one of the things I'm always um, listening for and trying to be mindful to is just letting patients know that as long as your license says what it says, any document prescriptions, et cetera, that I send lab results are going to be this way. Um, I, you know, it's gonna say that. So it's just recognizing that that's unfortunately the way that it is right now. On my end of my EMR, I see something totally different, but anything printed out, it's kind of like that default, that letter that you mentioned, Katie, you got from A&M, that's gonna say this other aspect. But um, the, the other aspect, I appreciate you so much for mentioning um, what you did, uh, talking about prostate, especially um, in my mind, that goes to preventive care. And like I said, um, earlier, trans care is preventive care. Um, it is the same type of care that we, primary care, and it's the same type of preventive measures that we provided primary care. So um, the one big thing that I see a lot of when I'm trying to provide those preventive measures is certainly a resurgence almost of some of the dysphoria that people experience with those body parts. So, um, you know, the PAP and pelvic um, guidelines are that an individual at 21 should have their first, regardless of whether or not they've had intercourse. And so for a trans guy, that is not something that they're looking forward to on the 21st birthday. That's not one of the things they're gonna be celebrating on the 21st. Um, and so that's one of the things that the longer that an individual goes without those things being monitored um, is certainly um, increasing risk for mortality. And, um, it's my job again to try to keep patients safe. So I, I know going into those conversations that it might be triggering and I try to be sensitive to it, but I also uh, assure patients that I will refer and make sure that whatever we're going to do, you're going to have the best possible experience that's out of my hands. So I'm going to refer to somebody that will be sensitive and mindful of this um, because I recognize that it can be triggering and upsetting because of you know individuals not necessarily wanting to acknowledge perhaps um, those those aspects of their body because they're getting to live without having to deal with them in certain ways. Um, but again, it's really just that preventive care aspect related to the anatomy that does still exist. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, one of the things and for you to talk about the aftercare of surgery, I loved hearing that because it's so true. And in the surgical letters that I write, I make sure um, when I'm talking to the patient and telling them in preparation for what the letter is gonna look like, I ask to find out who's gonna be around for your recovery. Where are you going to be recovering? Because that's so important. If I'm sending somebody to Austin, are they going to stay in Austin and recover for a little while and then come back to College Station? Um, will Who's gonna be with them during that window? Because it's so important. Um, and that be something patients haven't thought of, especially if they have a limited social or support group. Um, I always hope and pray that's not the case, but um, sometimes that is. And um, it's one of those things to, we keep talking about the minutia, but these little things that do make a really big difference. And, um, you know, I'd love to see some of those papers that talk about their risk for depression because, you know, I'd, I'd really strongly argue that um, certainly there's a risk for depression at any point along the transitioning. Um, you know, a lot of the times when we're talking about major surgeries, whether it be in um, you know, oftentimes it's along the lines of um, a mastectomy or a uh, orchiectomy. Um, there are aspects if we don't think about that we may not think about in the immediacy of the moment, but intimacy and how that changes your your role in however you're intimate and how much of a value you place on intimacy um, with you or your partner because a dynamic is going to change. There's going to be something that shifts. And if one person values that intimacy and then it's too dramatic of a shift, it really can create a rift for some individuals. And um, I certainly know a lot of people that after you know, perhaps having the testosterone blocker and recognizing, oh, okay, my libido was gone. Um, you know, that that's something they didn't like, whereas there might be some patients that 
really don't mind at all. Um, so there are just certain aspects of everything that can cause a big enough shift that would create emotion, emotional moments that individuals might not anticipate or have otherwise experienced or thought about. I think we both, we've all um, sort of touched on this, but mental health is a big part of this. Um, we haven't we've talked about the physical body, um, but yeah, mental health, having a therapist, um, Katie's story, I just keep hear, hearing it and thinking resilience, right? But, um, you know, having um, a therapist who is supportive of that, um, friends and family who are available for those, you know, coping skills and other stuff like that um, is so valuable and important. So yeah, yeah, definitely that mental health aspect, just because anxiety or, you know, a PTSD from like, as Katie was talking about being incarcerated or other stuff like that doesn't go away, right? Like these are lifelong things that, so I think the mental health aspect, having a plan in place, um, you know, and making sure we're checking in throughout the journey. Um, cause it is, you know, as Katie said, it's a lifelong process. <laughs> so yeah. You, I certainly counsel patients with, when we're talking about hormones, regardless of which hormone you will be receiving, there are dramatic in some cases side effects to the hormones and what they result in you know estrogen increased emotional response same thing with testosterone in terms of aggression sex drive just all sorts of things so um it certainly is regardless of which hormone is being um prescribed there's still going to be some emotional flux and change and if you add that on top of perhaps some previous or existing mental health condition. Um, there's, it can be kind of rocky and rough, but this is where the um, collaboration with providers and other mental health care providers, as well as um, medical providers is very critical and important. So that way the support is there and the assurance um, that, okay, this is a, a window and we can help. Um, there's something that we can always do to try to help, especially if it's a hormonally induced uh, flare, if you will, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, we are at time. Um, there are no questions on Facebook, so I wanted to give you both the opportunity um, to have a closing statement, um, and then I'll wrap us up. Sure. Uh, one thing I um, wanted to encourage is talking again about mental health. Don't let it, if, if you feel that a transition is something you need. Do not let your other mental health hold you back. As Matt has said, seek the appropriate care. Seek affirming care for you to get you through those things. It may mean that the two are not mutually exclusive. Many times they are not, but you still need care for the depression or whatever else, as well as um, gender dysphoria that you may be feeling. So. Um, the proper care is so very important. Um, it takes a village. We all know that, right? It takes a village for kids, but it takes a village for us as an adult. It takes a village our whole life through. Um, and we need to cultivate those sort of things. And I think we need to do better in community and trying to provide those things. There's a lot of stuff that goes on beyond our control in terms of insurance and policy and stuff like that. But the simplest thing we can do is be there for each other. And there's so many ways of doing that. And so I would encourage people to do that. As always, Pride Community Center is a resource you can turn to. Um, call us up, email us, um, however you want to get in contact with us. We'd be happy to listen and um, point you in what directions we, we can point you in. Um, I want to go back and just mention, circle back to one thing, um, frankly, we talked about the medical interventions, but there are certainly so many non-medical interventions and ways that individuals can achieve either ma masculinizing or feminizing um, effects. So like, I think of the masculinizing components, there are binders, as you mentioned earlier, um, there are packers, so there are things you can put in your underpants to make it appear as if you've got um, a penis. There are urination devices, that little funnel types of devices that you can use to stand up while you urinate. And certainly clothes, 
haircut, you know, the kind of aesthetic grooming um, components. And for feminine patients, I always talk about growing out hair and nails, um, certainly the cosmetic aspects of wearing bras uh, or wearing makeup, um, painting your nails. Yes, I mentioned bras, padded bras um, are another aspect. And if you wanted to be really extreme, call up your friend, the drag queen and find out where they got their, their breastplate. Um, certainly, uh, but then um, also um, clothes and all of the external aesthetic components. Um, there's a variety of ways. Yeah, they might cost, um, can be costly in some regards, but you mentioned even earlier online, um, you know, the presence of online shopping has made shopping for clothes that you normally would be embarrassed or otherwise afraid to buy. Um, now it's at your doorstep um, in the privacy of your own home. So, um, but yeah, as Katie mentioned, just seek out. Um, I'm so always pleasantly surprised to hear when patients have friends that they hear about me from or just online. Um, just there are so many resources. GLMA is a great website um, that you can go to to find provider searches for anything that you need. Um, whether it be psychiatric care to surgeons to um, gender affirming hormones. So um, use your resources, ask your friends, use your online resources and uh, do what you need to to get informed and get to where you want to. And it's a marathon, certainly not a sprint. And um, everyone's transition is their own. And I totally agree with Katie. Um, my jaw kind of dropped when you said someone said, so, you know, are you done transitioning? What does that even mean? Uh, so yeah, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, so shameless mental health, health plug resource. Um, if you are on campus and an a and student, CAPS is available. And also the Pride Center does host our Let's Talk program where you can come in and talk to a mental health practitioner. It is not therapy, um, but it is one to three. So you can stop by. Um, Thank you again so much uh, for taking part in this discussion. Uh, folks, if you enjoyed it, um, we will have semester programming throughout the semester. Um, we have a Pride Late Night coming up in March. We're very excited about that, March 29th in the center. The coming out monologues will be April 1st, uh, where we'll be hearing brave and raw stories about the coming out process. Lavender graduation will be April 9th, and then Rainbow Relaxing Days, um, our Come Do Crafts in the Center Days will be May 4th through the 10th. So we are so excited for the rest of the semester. Thank you both again.